computer. Okay. So well, here we are. Ta-da. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so um, hello in Zoom and uh, here. Thanks so much for coming. My name is Michael Gardner, one of the worship associates for the uh, church and uh, with Jim, uh, and with some help from many others uh, trying to coordinate the summer's fisherman services. Um, whoever you are, um, however you identify, whomever you love, wherever you may be on your spiritual journey, please know that for this time, you are part of this one gathered congregation and you are welcome here. Um, so a little bit of background for today. We checked this morning, it was 62 degrees. Um, sounds like that'd be fine. So I got down to the patio about 740, it was lovely. Couldn't imagine being anywhere else. So we set up and by 815, either the sun or the earth had moved and it was a completely different place. So we decided to uh, go with this again and take advantage of the uh, place people's wanting this place air conditioned, which is uh, part of where we're here. Uh, our uh, big uh, cause for celebration today is to welcome Cindy, um, who's making her debut presentation uh, to fishermen's service, uh, if not forever, at least since she's become the governing board president <laughs> again. So, um, you know, this, she's your leader, so or our leader, so, you know, please, please make her feel welcome. Uh, and uh, last week, uh, we forgot to acknowledge Bob Hughes, who uh, won a prestigious award from the Uncle Bill Bills or Wellspring Father, Father Bills, Uncle Bills. Oh my God, <laughs> Lord! Mainspring. Yeah, Mainspring. Father, yes. Yeah. Well, Mainspring. as you can see, I'm well prepared today. But uh, anyway, uh, Bob got a very nice award that um, got uh, distributed. A uh, notice of got distributed, at least among the uh, social justice uh, committee in the church, and he got lots of responsive accolades for that. Uh, we'll have coffee uh, in conversation after the service, which we will keep in here. Uh, for the air conditioning, and you'll all have the chance to pump Bob about what you have to do to win such an award yourselves. So, thank you, Cindy. Oh, thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, this is actually not my debut overall. I've done one about 20 years ago, <laughs> whatever, a long time ago. And um, so, Hello, good morning. Um, I have, I don't know if this is actually, is this um, amplifying my voice? No, all right. So I know that I have a problem with speaking really softly and not projecting. So just wave at me if you can't hear me or if you can't hear me and you don't care, then that's okay too. So back in mid June, I signed up to do a fisherman's service today. It's one fisherman, is it? One fisherman? We don't know. Or multiple fishermen. I can never remember, and but Michael doesn't know. And anyhow, I had no idea of what I was going to speak about, but I figured I had a lot of time to figure it out. And I have really thought about it a lot, but nothing seemed interesting enough or appropriate. One day, I think July 3rd, I think it was, I was on a hike with Jim Hamilton. I wish he was here today because he could corroborate that fact. But alas, he is away. Anyhow, we walked for about two and a half hours with Amy and a couple of other women who I hiked the Bay Circuit Trail with. Actually, the Bay Circuit Trail might have been an interesting topic. We had a core of seven women. Although the number would fluctuate, Nancy Langren was one of our hikers. The number would fluctuate, fly, fluctuate, and we hiked from Newburyport to Kingston Bay. We walked in six to 10 mile increments, although we aimed for about eight miles. 10 miles was only when we either misinterpreted the maps or the trail abruptly stopped once because the bridge we were supposed to cross was down. We might have walked closer to 11 or 12 miles that day and we were so tired. Of course, there was the one time we got lost at the end and couldn't find where we parked the car, my husband's brand new car. We were in a residential neighborhood and people would stop to ask if we needed help, but no one would actually give us a ride. I think they were a little leery of seven old ladies who had no idea where they wanted to go. 
So what did seven women in their 60s and 70s do? We called an Uber. And a lovely young man with a seven passenger car, we did not know it would be a seven passenger car, came and rescued us. Of course, when he heard our dilemma, we didn't actually know where our car was. He probably thought we were all loose as gooses, but he was game and off we went in what we thought was the right direction. And indeed, in about a mile, we came across our car. We were all, including our driver, laughing pretty hysterically by this point, and he was such a good egg. He even agreed to get out of his car and have his picture taken with us. This whole walk took us about four years, April 2017 to the fall of 2021. It would have been shorter if COVID hadn't happened. We walked once a month, all year long, through rain and ice. I fell six times one day on the ice in poison ivy, along marshes, crossing streams and rivers, and up pretty high hills, through lots of forests and fields, sometimes along roads, which was not my favorite. There were a lot of historical sites and we stopped and admired them all. I especially liked the remains of Thoreau's cabin in Concord, which I don't think I'd ever been to before. <clears throat> Two of us were always birding. Pileated woodpeckers were my favorite as we don't often get those on the South shore. We carried our lunches, PB and J for me, and ate sometimes sitting on rocks, sometimes on benches, once on picnic tables at a library. And we always, always, always ended with ice cream. Boy, do we find good ice cream places. If you wanna know more about our walk, and if you are on Facebook, we have a Facebook page called Bay Circuit Trail Adventures. Anyhow, <clears throat> back to hiking with Jim and trying to find a topic for a fisherman's or a fisherman's service. He suggested birds, which would have been a reasonable topic because I have been a lifelong birder, feeding them at home and traveling to many places in the US to attend birding festivals or just to go birding. I've had the amazing opportunity to bird in a coffee plantation in Guatemala, in national forest in Costa Rica, in the ocean off Peru where we saw penguins. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Penguins, penguins, penguins. While I was birding in that coffee plantation, my husband was getting heat stroke up in the cloud forest, guarded by guard dogs and guns to keep them safe from God knows what. It's a crazy story. It should, you should ask him about it one day. It has includes a safe house and a safe room down a some sort of a chute and ask him. I could have told the story if we were doing birds about when I came to church one day and Robbie Walsh, our previous minister, and our previous administrative assistant, Barbara Floyd, were all in a dither. They had the doors to the kitchen closed and were almost literally pacing around outside of it. Why? Because there was a bird in the kitchen. What kind of bird, I asked. <clears throat> they had no idea. They both had seen it, but didn't know what it was. I was excited. I thought maybe it was something a little exotic. So in I went. What did I see? A little bitty terrified black capped chickadee. Now, my granddaughters, both by the age of two, could identify black capped chickadees, along with quite a few other species. But these two adults, both of whom had spent a great deal of time in New England, couldn't identify a chickadee. Did I poke a little fun at them? Yes, for years. Anyhow, I gently cupped the chickadee and guided it out the open window. Disaster averted. So when Jim and I were walking and trying to think of a topic, I said what was really on my mind these days was turning 70. I had never before had a birthday that stopped me in my tracks. But on May 28th this year, I turned 70. And I am bothered by it. 
Not as much as I was initially, but still. I began to think in terms of years remaining. I began to think in terms of what my elder years, elder years were going to look like. I began to wonder if I would see my grandchildren grow up. I had never considered these things before. I suggest, suggested to Jim that I should seek a therapist for this, that it would be hard because it would need to be a therapist who is female and it also already turned 70. Experience, right? He thought anybody would be trained to deal with my issues, but I was and am adamant. You don't know like what it's like until you get there. I was excited about this topic, but then I thought, well, my angst about turning 70, <clears throat> delivering my angst in front of this crowd probably fell into the inappropriate category. I mean, most of you have me beat and are apparently doing just dandy. So who am I to moan about anything? So I decided not to talk about that. Then Jim suggested my mother's cooking. What? No, my mother was a really good cook. What could I say? When I was sick as a kid, she always made me hot lemonade and milk toast. I loved milk toast. It was almost worth getting sick to get it. I was the youngest of six kids. I didn't get a lot of special one-on-one -on -one attention. I'm not complaining about that, it's just a fact. Although I did have special status as the baby. Just ask my sister. But I loved milk toast. And when I was little, we had an English woman living with us as my sisters and my nanny. My four older brothers had my parents hopping with all their sports events, and they probably didn't want to drag us along. I don't know this for sure, but in their place, I wouldn't want to drag us along. Anyhow, Coops, also known as Helen Cooper, but we always called her Coops, decided one day to make me milk toast when I was sick. It was filled with lumps and I wouldn't eat it. Legend has it, it was the only time my mother and Coops had crossed words. Coops was insisting I eat it and my mother was insisting I didn't have to. Coops was an extraordinarily wonderful woman and I loved her dearly, but she wasn't a cook. And I have no recollection of what happened to that lumpy milk toast. My bedtime stories with Coops were filled with stories of World War II London with the bombings and the blackouts and soldiers coming back with shell shock. I don't know why, but I loved listening to those stories over and over. I wonder if my mother knew. And Coops loved to walk too. Every night in summer after dinner, we would walk, sometimes to the Bluefish River, sometimes to Shipyard Lane, we called it shipyard boom, because as I was saying it one night on a walk, I fell down and went boom. I have always had a penchant for falling down. One night we went down to the waterfront in the yacht club where we were members at that time. I was about three years old. My brothers and my sister were there swimming. So I decided to swim too. Off the dock and into the deep water I went and swam quite nicely to the ladder. I think Coops might have come close to a heart attack, but I never looked back and have been swimming ever since. As I was writing this, I realized that it might not have been Coops that was with us that night, because I think maybe I was four when she came to us, but the story is otherwise true and really doesn't matter which babysitter I almost scared to death. So Jim and I walked and talked and he kept throwing ideas at me and I kept saying, no, favorite movie? That's hard, Carol and Maude maybe, or Star Wars? Favorite book? Hmm, there are so many. I used to read under the covers as a kid with a flashlight until all hours. I devoured the Cherry Ames Nurse series. Do any of you remember that? I re also read historical biographies of women as a kid. Susan B. Anthony and such. One of my all time favorites as an adult is fried green tomatoes at the Whipple Whistle Stop Cafe by Fanny Flagg. It was and is for me a feminist manifesto. 
Now I mostly read mysteries, a little murder to escape the tragedy of real life. I'm currently rereading the entire Louise Penny series with Chief Inspector Gamache in the wonderful characters of Three Pines in Quebec. I am enjoying rereading it so much, it's really a guilty pleasure. Perfect for summer. But I couldn't figure out a whole service on books or movies. Well, maybe books. Anyhow, I kept circling around, birds, the bay circuit, my mother's cooking, my angst at turning 70. Did I mention that I had a really nice family party planned out by my family for my 70th? But that I got COVID and couldn't visit with anyone but my granddaughters because they had COVID too? The lobsters and steamers were canceled, as was the trip to Island Creek oysters. I did manage to eat almost an entire carrot cake by myself, however, because it had been ordered and there weren't too many people to share it with. And I do love carrot cake. I did not lose my sense of taste with COVID, but I did lose my sense of humor for a bit because after all, I was turning 70 and I couldn't celebrate, celebrate it and being sick makes you think of being sick. What would that final sickness be? Now that is a pretty morbid thought, so we won't go there, but I was hounded by it for a while. It's just so different from turning 60, and I'm sure very different from 80, but it's my dilemma after all, and I have to find a way to deal with it. Actually, I think I'm mostly pretty okay with it now. Perhaps it had more to do with the circumstances of turning 70 and having COVID. I am active and healthy and have always been a day at a time sort of a person. Which leads me to this topic, me. Actually, this whole ramble has been about me. I am the luckiest person I know. I am healthy. And besides multiple orthopedic injuries from falling and such, I have been mostly healthy. I'm just a little prone to hurting myself. Remember those six falls on the ice I spoke about? That's me. But I have a loving and healthy family, a loving and healthy marriage, three great kids and their three significant others, three amazing granddaughters, and a huge extended family whom I am quite close to. Ooh, there's the topic, who versus whom. I was an English major and can never remember which I am supposed to use when. Well, it hasn't made my life any less happy not knowing it, so I'm not gonna worry about it. I was lucky to have a couple of good careers and my husband and I have enough. Not over the top, but not too little either, enough. My retirement eight and a half years ago, crazy how time flies, has been full. I spent, spent the last couple of years serving this church as the vice president with Jim Hamilton as your president. This past June, I was voted in as president for the next two years. <clears throat> Please talk to me if you have anything at all related to the church. A couple of years ago, with some encouragement, I decided to run for the select board in Duxbury. At the time, it was the board of selectmen, but as there were now two women on the board, we lobbied to change it and were successful. I find being on the select board challenging and rewarding, and I love it. So if you are a Duxbury resident, you can talk to me about town affairs as well. I love to talk to people. I'm also involved with Dari, Duxbury Afghan Resettlement Initiative with many other members of First Parish Church and many town residents as well. It's been so rewarding to see this family of two young adults and six kids begin to thrive. That could really be a topic for one of these services. Also, I started a new hobby, rug hooking. I am now hooking a fairly large rug with pictures of Star Island. Star Island would make another great fisher person service now that I think of it. <clears throat> I get, began bringing my kids there when Jackie Smith Miller was DRE. We all fell in love with it. Of course, there was a year I had to go in a wheelchair because I had fractured one of my ankles and severely sprained the other one. Anyhow, the rug. The rug is for my daughter and her husband who met on Star Island. 
It is a special, special, special place for all of us. My granddaughters love it too. They go with their parents and their other grandparents and their cousins every year. I go at least yearly for a birding trip and or a rug hooking camp. All my topics seem to cover overlap. Birds, travel, falling down. One year on a trip to Star for a birding weekend, a bird that was a life bird for me, which means that it's a bird I had never seen before in my life, was found. It's called the Chuck's Will Widow, mostly found in the Southeast of the US, sometimes called a goat sucker down there due to a myth about them and goats. It is a member of the Nightjar family. The name comes from its song, but I won't attempt to sing it for you. Sometimes people confuse the Chuck's Will Widow <clears throat> with another Nightjar, a whippoorwill, which is, was, when I was a kid anyhow, more common up here. I was beyond excited to see it, <clears throat> as was everyone else in the trip. Birding really can be really exciting. Mostly it's an excuse to get outside, sometimes in the same place over and over to see what changes and what remains the same, and sometimes to go and explore different places. I seem to have come back to birding, which is maybe what I should have chosen for a topic. It's really impacted my life, and I really am enjoying passing on my passion to my grandkids. <clears throat> Did I mention their names? I should in case they listen. Vivian, Beatrix, and Hazel. They are curly and gorgeous and funny and spunky, and I adore them. Well, Hazel isn't as spunky yet because she's only seven weeks old. She was born while we all had COVID, including her mom and dad. It was a crazy time but all are healthy, so that is a true blessing, as is she. Anyhow, birding. Vivi and B have caught the birding bug for me a little and are always eager to tell me their birding stories or to point out birds to me. They had a nest of robins in their swing set this year that just fledged. I love, love, love it. Something in the birding world has me troubled, however, and this truly could have been yet another fisherman's or men's topic. It's a topic I'm wrestling with, although I really do know what the answer should be. John James Audubon, the famed bird illustrator and a person for who or whom the national, state and local Audubon societies were named for, was not only a slaveholder, but really a white supremacist. He was known to utilize his slaves for boat trips down the Mississippi River, then sell them off when he got there <clears throat> just to buy more slaves later. He used black and native, pe native peoples to produce his tremendous book, The Birds of America. The book was and is an amazing artistic and ornithological achievement. That can't be denied. However, even though he used the assistance of black and native people their knowledge as well as their physical labor, he never equated them with himself. He bemoaned the release of the slaves in the West Indies. The lesser known story of Audubon is a dark one and needs to come to light. Just last week, the Seattle Audubon Society voted to drop the name Audubon. They haven't figured out a new name yet, but I thought, but thought it was important enough to drop the Audubon name. And I agree with Seattle. And I actually saw in the paper briefly this morning that Mass Audubon has voted differently. I don't know much about it. I didn't get a chance to read the article. <clears throat> I agree with Seattle, even though the brand Audubon has been dear to me for so many years. Going to a new place, a new city, I would offer, often look up Audubon to find a local place to go birding. I have been and continue to be a member of both National Audubon and Massachusetts Audubon for years and years. It's a familiar and well-loved name. But history shows <clears throat> that it was named without full knowledge by a couple of Boston ladies who are working to save birds. Audubon was an important environmentalist, but we cannot continue to overlook his racial legacy. 
If there's any time in American history where this could happen, it must be now. And it would be a good topic for fishermen's or men's service. So as you've heard, there are many topics out there. They just need to be fleshed out a little. For instance, I never did tell you much about my mother's cooking. I never told you she baked my wedding cake, a delicious carrot cake <clears throat> that she made the very best clam chowder ever, or that she actually overcooked green beans. But I did start to tell you about coops and she would have been a great topic as well. So Jim was right. There are topics out there. You just have to flush them out. I hope this was helpful for you when you go to choose your own topics. I know there's two openings. I know it was helpful for me. If I ever do this again, I have lots of topics to choose from. And for some reason, I want to end with an E.E. E. Cummings poem. It has nothing to do really with the rest of it. It's a guidepost for me. And of course, could start yet another topic. I believe in this poem, E.E. E. Cummings was writing about not only the beauty of the earth, which really has a lot to do with what is important to me, but also his belief in God with a capital G. I don't believe in his God, but I do believe in this poem and in thanking whatever or whoever made it possible. I thank you God for most this amazing day for the leaping greenly spirits of trees in a blue true dream of sky and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I who have died am alive again today and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birth day of life and of love and wings and of the gay great happening illimitably earth. How should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing, any lifted from the know of all nothing human, merely being doubt unimaginable you. Now the ears of my ears awake, now the eyes of my eyes are open. Thank you. Cindy was a, a bit critical of me uh, yesterday or the day before <laughs> um, in terms of uh, my describing her talk was going to be scintillating uh, and she... <laughs> She thought that was a bit too much pressure, but I think we can all agree that once again, I was right. <laughs> um, uh, and now if you'll just uh, uh, please join in prayer. Um, may, may we understand and honor the value of participation, friendship and commitment as personified by Cindy. Uh, and her contributions to our community uh, and are true of so, so many others here that we must remind ourselves to value. Thank you for honoring nature, for childhood memories, for the looming future uh, and Thank you all for participating. It'd be so. Amen. And there are two dates still open, <laughs> August 21st and September 4th. So, you know, I mean, it's a pretty prime spot here. So people, uh, you know, you, you got to step up for it if, if you'd like the chance and we'd love to have you do it. Um, and um, before I give up the mic again, I just wanted to say two things about uh, birding. Uh, one is that the, the first time I realized that uh, or understood that Cindy was a dedicated birder, uh, we were in some committee. I don't know if it was worship or ministerial or what, but and she was more excited than Robbie and Barbara were frustrated 
when she had told us the news that some, I guess, exotic, um, uh, some bird from, uh, I think the Caribbean, Mexico. from Mexico was uh, in the area and it had a very uh, strange name, uh, which I don't remember at all, but I'm sure she does. And I think she was talking about going out and seeing it someplace in Southeastern Mass or somewhere. Um, so uh, maybe she'll tell you about that. Uh, and the other thing is my, uh, she talked about movies. Um, my favorite movie about birding is got Owen Wilson in it and it's got the word year in it. That's either the good year or the best year or the some kind of year in which there's a contest uh, among serious birders to have, make the most sightings. And um, I'm sure Cindy knows that movie and maybe she can tell you about it too. Um, and uh, now, Alas, I've got no more to say. So, uh, <laughs> coffee is here. And for those of you at home, um, see, we can get an actual count except for the phone number, the 781 number. Um, I figure there's probably 10 people listening from that, that number. So I'll count that unless one of you wants to end up and email Sherry or me and tell us how many of you there really are. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And there were 13 here. So thanks very much. Um, next week, um, it is um, uh, Emily and Kate are going to talk about their experiences this summer at Ferry Beach, which is like sort of a Star Island thing, only different, I think. Um, but you know, I don't know. And if you don't know, you'll have to come and listen one way or the other. We hope you do. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Okay, hey, here's the food. So Michael, press it here and here. Oh, well, please tell them. And oh, uh, hold on, people. Just so that you know, it was a crested cara cara. And as much as I ribbed Robbie about the um, black cap chickadees, he ribbed me about the crested cara cara. And it's the big year. The big year. The big year. Right. Okay. All right. You heard it here. Um, I'm, oh, Eleanor, for goodness sake. Somebody was in the waiting room. Oh, about that. Okay. What was that? Oh, I had six. Uh, I, shall I put you in a breakout room or just let you go? You can just, you can keep talking if you unmute yourselves. All right. I, Good morning, Michael. Hey there. Oh, how are you? This is Sally calling. Um, the, I'm the 781 phone number, and oh, okay. I've been think from Michigan. Oh, Sally, nice to talk to you. That's great. Um, you're, you're probably our long distance record holder from both last week and this week from Michigan. At one point, we had Helen Cato early in the pandemic from England, but. Um, uh, Michigan's about as, as far as we uh, are, are traveling these days, so very glad to have you. Uh, and uh, safe home when you arrived, you know, uh, have you a plan on when you'll be coming back? Well, not for sure, but sometime in August. Okay, all right. Well, we'll look forward to uh, seeing you when you're here, and uh, safe home. Okay, okay. thanks for coordinating. Bye-bye. Sure. Mike? You're muted, Sherry. Uh, Eleanor is still trying to connect to audio. I don't know who that is. And uh, was she in the waiting room or something? Yeah, well, you know, I'm not up here, so I didn't see it. I, I just, when I came back, uh, uh, Eleanor was in the waiting room. So it uh, might be Eleanor McGonigal, but she's yeah. still trying to connect with audio. Anyway, um, it'll be, it'll be, um, oh, it'll be re recorded. I yeah, mean, it'll be like about um, ending the recording. Yeah.